Patreon, give us a support. Every dollar helps. We're breaking even. It's the best part about the server. So any anything you guys can do is great. We're on Patreon DGQC. Uh, and of course, you can join our server at any time and join in these conversations. Today, we are going to be... Ben, your mic's coming through. Uh, today, we are going to be uh, reading through uh, section 2.4, the disjunctive synthesis of recording uh, of Anti-Oedipus. Uh, so please... Join along. I am streaming the text both on YouTube for our one viewer there, hello one viewer, as well as uh, you guys inside of. When Oedipus slips into the disjunctive syntheses of desiring recording, it imposes the ideal of a certain restrictive or exclusive use on them that becomes identical with the form of triangulation, being daddy, mommy, or child. This is the reign of the either-or in the differentiating function of the prohibition of incest. Here is where mommy begins. There daddy, and there you are. Stay in your place. Oedipus's misfortune is indeed that it no longer knows who begins where nor who is who, and being parent or child is also accompanied by two other differentiations on the other sides of the triangle, being man or woman, being dead or alive. Oedipus must not know whether it is alive or dead, man or woman, any more than it knows whether it is parent or child. Commit incest, and you'll be a zombie and a hermaphrodite. In this sense, indeed, the three major neuroses that are termed familial seem to correspond to Oedipal lapses in the differentiating function or in the disjunctive synthesis. The phobic person can no longer be sure whether he is parent or child, the obsessed person whether he is dead or alive, the hysterical person whether he is man or woman. In short, the familial triangulation represents the minimum condition under which an ego takes on the coordinates that differentiate it at one and the same time with regard to generation, sex, and vital state. And the religious triangulation confirms this result in another mode. Thus, in the Trinity, the obliteration of the feminine image in favor of a phallic symbol demonstrates how the triangle displaces itself toward its own cause and attempts to reintegrate it. This time, it is a matter of the maximum conditions under which persons are differentiated. Hence, the importance of Kantian definition that posits God as the a priori principle of the disjunctive syllogism so that all things derive from it by a restriction of a larger reality. Omnitudo realitat is. Kant's humor makes God into the master of a syllogism. Dives right in, this section. Uh, damn. So, uh, as we just finished talking about the uh, connective synthesis, uh, which is how we are able, our desiring machines connect, how they deal with partial objects, how they play within things. Uh, the, the nature of how Oedipus affects that. This jumps directly into the disjunctive synthesis of recording, which is where the recording happens. It's where our signs are created. It's where our relations are created. And it opens immediately into uh, the ideal of restrictive or exclusive use on them, which is what Oedipus in representation does. Uh, Oedipus being the triangle basically forces desiring machines into a handful of things to relate to. Becoming daddy, becoming mommy, becoming me. This triangulation is all we have, which means that we have to be man or woman. Combination of both is neurosis, but it eliminates our, what they would call non-human sexes, for example. Uh, the, the nature of this that forces us into that triangle is where, this is where that happens inside of the disjunctive synthesis of recording. Uh, anyone? I'm still getting over that. You won't pronounce the French, but you went for the Latin. I, Latin's easier than French. I feel less embarrassing when I read it. I feel very embarrassed whenever I read French. I mean, was I badly done in the Latin? Maybe my Latin's terrible too, and I just, like, French people are more apt to tell me that my, my French is terrible than Latin people tell me my Latin's awful. Entirely possible. You're in luck. I don't think we'll find any Latin people. They're <laughs> kind of extinct. Just a Brazilian correcting you on it. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's the essentially what they're diving into here and we're going to be getting into is this nature of the Trinity, the nature of the mommy, daddy, me thing that uh, Oedipus forces upon our recording. It forces us to take it in and the idea of 
not knowing where one begins or another starts is kind of the idea here. Because again, representations don't operate as pure, uh, concretized signs. They're ideas, they're representations. And because of that, we have to fit within them, and that's difficult, we'll say. Well, now that okay. we made it... Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, there's, there's like hinting here even at uh the the move Jalouz and Guitari are gonna make later. They're talking about how uh in short the familial triangulis triangulation represents the minimum condition under which an ego takes on the coordinates that differentiate it at once and the same time with regard to generation, sex, and vital state. So this is already them foreshadowing a attack on Plato's idea of the same and similar and their establishment of an ontology of the different and differential. They're, 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 they're already saying that like, the only reason that this works is because uh, we're viewing everything as the same and that it needs differentiation from other things. Uh, any other comments before we move on to the next paragraph? Jack, go for it. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about the Plato, but um, because they're responding to, so in the previous section at the very end, right, we can finally get into this point about um, psychoanalysis metaphysics, right? In like fashion, we are compelled to say that psychoanalysis has its metaphysics. Its name is Oedipus. And that a, a revolution, this time materialist, can, only perce can proceed only by way of a critique of Oedipus by denouncing the illegitimate use of the syntheses of the unconscious as found in Oedipal psychoanalysis, so as to rediscover a transcendental unconscious defined by the eminence of its criteria and a corresponding practice that we shall call schizoanalysis. So the, the quote you just read, I'm really glad you bring up Ben, because I think that's one of the clearest places to see where they're talking about the metaphysics in this first paragraph. So with the familial triangulation, right, that represents the minimum condition under which an ego, or a so-called ego, takes on the coordinations, right, that differentiate it at one and the same, uh, same time with regard to generation sets in the vital state. So this is a long way of saying, right, there's a condition, uh, Oedipus provides conditions for um, things to take place, right? So like to Brooks' point about the exclusive disjunction, the way it affects desiring machines, uh, so we can understand this sense is the Oedipal triangulation makes it possible for there to be uh, the ego in this capacity, and then for that, e uh, that ego to basically take on uh, the either or disjunction of sets or generation or what have you. Yes, and I would say the, the use of disjunction here, again, when we talk about the three syntheses, I, I put a wonderful link up from a Anarchist Without Content. It's a Thing we've referenced quite often about what the three syntheses are. The disjunctive synthesis is the either or, it's the separation of partial objects. It's the things that don't connect, the separation of all of it. This is not necessarily itself a bad thing. It's actually quite good. It breaks us from instinctual determinism, as they say. Uh, the existing connection gets interrupted and redirected towards a different connection. It's what makes us continually move on to things rather than just fixate and do that, obsess until we die. Obviously, there's challenges there. Uh, with Oedipus, because this is where it starts doing the thing it does and it begins that process, it forces us to basically have connections or disconnections or lack of connections between stuff that may or may not be related uh, on a what we might call a material uh, level. So I'm going to continue to the next paragraph because it gets into this. Uh, the action characteristic of Oedipal recording is the introduction of an exclusive, restrictive, and negative use of the disjunctive synthesis. We are so molded by Oedipus that we find it hard to imagine another use, and even the three familial neuroses do not escape this use, although they suffer from no longer being capable of applying it. Everywhere in psychoanalysis, in Freud, we have seen this taste for exclusive disjunctions assert itself. It becomes nevertheless apparent that schizophrenia teaches us a singular extra Oedipal lesson and reveals to us an unknown force of the disjunctive synthesis, an imminent use that would no longer be exclusive or restrictive, but fully affirmative, non-restrictive, inclusive. A disjunction that remains disjunctive 
and that still affirms the disjoined terms, that affirms them throughout their entire distance, without restricting one by the other or excluding the other from the one, is perhaps the greatest paradox. Either or, or, instead of either or. Uh, not an easy step to take. Uh, if anyone, by the way, uh, we've, we went over this the first time around. If anyone has an example of that final bit or a way to describe that that brings it down to earth, I would love it. Because uh, what they're describing here is that is what I was talking about, the, the sort of the good use, that Oedipus adds this extra layer on top of things. The schizophrenia teaches us actually that things can be what we might put, um, put doing air quotes, disconnected or unrelated or either or or but it's not a full separation. It's not a breaking of, it's not uh, prescriptive, uh, sort of inside of itself, what either or, or, or means. Uh, give me two seconds, I'll find, uh, I'll leave it open if anyone wants to comment. I, I think I know of a good example I'll come back to. And I'd like to walk it out just a little bit further than Desiring Machines here because um, we're in the second synthesis deep right now, right? So we need to, we need to bring in the body without organs and the way it's moving um, desiring machines, which ultimately we're going to have to start talking here. We're going to be getting more deeply into the molar level too. But so, right, what we're getting at here with the negative use here is that the, when it comes to the miraculating and the, um, the repulsion processes, right, where the body without organs at one point is falling back on production, but is also move, um, sort of coordinating it. Yeah. And having it coordinated upon its, um, it's a miraculative surface, right? So we're seeing how this disjunction creates a negative use in the sense that functionalities, uh, the capacity to change those functionalities during the assemblage are basically being restricted. But there's also, we have to point out too, that with this restriction is also coming the way in which um, that counterflow from the body without organs, right? That gives us our paranoiac and schizophrenic machines that's a this is affected by the exclusive disjunction to basically limit that flow so as to kind of um right so we're placing it into instead of like the the or 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 where the the functionalities and that the capacities are changing uh we're still getting a change but it's in a very different and narrow uh consideration here now i would say um a good example of this and we have to go kind of back to the use, why he's using the term exclusive disjunction comes from older work of his in deference or repetition where he talks about the inclusive disjunction. And the, the commentary he gives around that is essentially that uh, an inclusive disjunction, which is the separation of things, would be like being able to allow a series of different paths that all lead slightly different directions but can coexist along each other. There's no reason for us to force one and destroy the other. Exclusive disjunctions do that. You choose one path, it becomes the truth, the rest is effectively thrown out. Um, this, the use of the disjunction is to allow uh, either or, 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 is saying that you have either this or that or that or that. It, it's a plethora of possibilities in front of you. Versus with uh, Oedipus, you are a man, either a man or a woman. It's two choices, and you pick one. By the way, you pick one. You do not get to be sort of a man, kind of a woman. That's fucked up. We can't allow that in our nuclear family society. Um, this is the exclusive disjunction. The inclusive is allowing all of these possibilities to exist alongside each other. Are you man, sort of man, sort of woman, trans man, trans woman, NB, uh, all the other things that could come out of it. It's difficult for me to ramble right now, but that's, that's kind of the setup here of the either or or, which is good, the either or bad. It's a short version, uh, as I understand it. Uh -huh. I think uh, if you look into Proust and Signs a lot, uh, I was, I'm reading Proust and Signs, so it's like constantly in the forefront of my brain. Uh, he talks a lot about uh, the importance of perspectives and points of view in the existence of things. And uh, like I, I read not only like the include of disjunction as it's either this thing or that thing or that thing or that thing but it's almost like dancing around uh sort of the implication of a holographic universe like it it's either this 
everything from the point of view of this or everything from the point of view of that or everything from the point of view of that or everything from the point of view of that like uh all all the disjunctions are always inclusive right so like when we choose something we're we're like choosing the perspective or point of view of it which uh he would he has a line uh in Proust and signs i like that says without art or which with which without art we would never know it exists in the first place so like if if a thing can't uh produce its point of view or like produce it into the world then like we 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 don't even know that its perspective exists so, so but that that's not really what this is about what i'm saying is like the either or 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 could it also like kind of be dancing around that idea of sort of implying a holographic universe I would, I would generally, I, I think I just generally agree with you. Um, I think my phrasing is slightly different, but I think, again. Oh, please rephrase it. My phrasing's terrible. I know. No, no, I, 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 I use I, words I, wrong all the time. Uh, the, the way um, a person exists or the way that a thing is, if we sit there and we go, excellent, the way a thing is, is towards the singular point due to representation. That's not allowing us to build what I would say from the ground up is the possibilities through allowing connections, seeing where we disconnect, and allowing us to sort of exist in that freedom of connecting and disconnecting as we do, versus having a prescriptive representation that is at the far end. If we think of our process as, excellent, I've been told what a man is, I've been told what Oedipus is, I've been told how a city works, or what a village is, or how a job should be. These things force us down a sp very specific path in terms of behavior, in terms of activity, in terms of perspective. Uh, the ability for us to throw everything together is the inclusive disjunction. It's I'm able to make these choices and sort of charge through life and possibility is always there of switching or dodging around or doing other things. But the idea of having an exclusive use uh, the exclusive disjunction which is a singular point not a multiplicity and also lives inside a representation is i think the specific thing that they're starting to talk against so I, I like the i like the phrasing of the perspective you did there the thing i've got to interject though is we're when we talk about choice and that like it sounds like we're putting this back into the subject choosing at this point we're talking about how the paralogism of the synthesis. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm using shorthand. I'm, a, I'm, I'm aware I'm using shorthand and I should be more careful. But again, the saying this long becomes a very, very like there's a there's a reason this thing's a whole book. So like when I say choice, I'm well, being very particular in the sense of it. There are options. There is a multitude of possibilities in front of us. That's the choice that I mean. The disjunctive synthesis is the one that basically separates us and we head down those directions and the subject comes afterwards. Yes. Right, and so where I'm going with this is to say that choices in the first place, whatever choices you have, and more so the way the functionalities get dispersed, that's all conditioned by, the, the I, as I'm thinking about the relationship of the, um, the inclusive and the exclusive disjunction, where the, the, the paralogistic use is affecting um, the inclusive disjunction at that level, right? So the interesting thing here in that sense is that the either or is playing on how the unconscious is going to produce that either or, 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 right? So by the time that we get constituted, right, I think this is their point about saying Oedipus makes you into like a zombie or a hermaphrodite, right? That because the triangulation integrates what's a, um, what it's working with, right, there is a change taking place there. The integration makes um, capacities or functionalities uh, under that, that coordination of either or, right? Yes, I'm, I'm actually going to read the next paragraph because it gets into this, and then I'm going to answer Jasper Maisie's uh, comment real quick after that. Uh, the schizophrenic is not man and woman. He is man or woman, but he belongs precisely to both sides, man on the side of men, women on the side of woman. Likeable Jaya, Jaya, Albert Desire, matriculation number 54161110001, intones the litany of the parallel series of the masculine and the feminine, and places himself on both sides. The schizophrenic is dead or alive, not both at once, 
but each of the two as the terminal point of a distance over which he glides. He is child or parent, not both, but the one at the end of the other, like the two ends of a stick in the non-decomposable space. This is the meaning of the disjunctions where Beckett records his characters and the events that befall them. Everything divides, but into itself. Even the distances are positive, at the same time as the included disjunctions. Uh, uh, Jasper says, uh, I always think of exclusive disjunction as in-group, out-group. I actually don't think that's far off. Um, the way I would look at it is when we talk about what success is. What is an American? Let's talk about an American. I can tell you uh, what people don't see as an American, the vast majority, and that's Mexicans, trans people, uh, gays, uh, socialists, like there's a big litany, but white waspy uh, men, for sure. That kind of is the picture I think even everyone has. The, whatever it may be, who's waving that American flag and swinging it? That's the way it works. Now, when we talk about that, the way that that works is it automatically creates in and out groups. It creates in and out people. It creates uh, either or as a thing. Now, this works for in and out groups. This works for everything all the way through. The nature of the setup then becomes quickly uh, when I have an inclusive disjunction, uh, like they're talking about here, it's not that I am American or not. It's not that I am man and woman. Like one is not everything at the same time. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about being able to glide between them, that these things are poles that exist effectively on the body without organs. And I'm able to relate them how I do for where I happen to be. Uh, that's how I read this paragraph uh, and, and this, this sort of uh, concept. Hey, Brooks, the note 20, the, the, all this stuff about the, 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 that series of artwork do we know what these works of art are? Do we have, has anybody in this chat seen them? Or we like, had, we had them last time we were reading this and we brought them up. Uh, I went back and looked through before today. They don't add, like, they're good if we want to do like an hour on it. Very quickly, they don't add very much to the discussion. It's a very big oh. understanding of specifically these works, how they operate, how they came to be. The story and genesis of them is what matters. I'll be back in two seconds. No. I have to close my door. For sure. Uh, I'm not trying to like talk about the works of art specifically. I would just like to see them for myself at some point. So if somebody could like link them, that would be super awesome is all I'm asking. Since you've asked about footnote 20, it's from the Art Brut, number three, page 139. Uh, and I'm quoting directly from the reference notes. In his presentation, Jean, Jean Ori calls Jaya, quote, the non delimited, end quote, also quoted, in permanent flight, end quote. So, right, something that's doing the either or, 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 but also is in the, the permanent flight. So there's the uh, a sense of like a line of uh, escape there. All right, I'm going to continue to the next paragraph because it continues the point. It would be a total misunderstanding of this order of thought if we concluded that the schizophrenic substituted vague syntheses of identification on con of contradictory elements for disjunctions, like the last of the Hegelian philosophers. He does not substitute syntheses of contradictory elements for disjunctive syntheses, Rather, for the exclusive and restrictive use of the disjunctive synthesis, he substitutes an affirmative use. He is and remains in disjunction. He does not abolish disjunction by identifying the contradictory elements by means of elaboration. Instead, he affirms it through a continuous overflight spanning an indivisible distance. He is not simply bisexual, or between the two, or intersexual. He is transsexual. He is trans alive dead, trans parent child. He does not reduce two contraries to an identity of the same. He affirms their distance as that which relates the two as different. He does not confine himself inside contradictions. On the contrary, he opens out and, like a spore case inflated with spores, releases them as so many singularities that he had improperly shut off some of which he intended to exclude while retaining others. 
but which now become points signs, all affirmed by their new distance. The disjunction, being now inclusive, does not closet itself inside its own terms. On the contrary, it is non-restrictive. Quote, I was then no longer this closed box to which I owed being so well preserved, but a partition came crashing down, end quote. an event that will liberate a space where Malloy and Moran no longer designate persons, but singularities flocking from all sides, evanescent agents of production. This is free disjunction. The differential positions persist in their entirety. They even take on a free quality, but they are all inhabited by a faceless and transpositional subject. Schreber is man and woman, parent and child, dead and alive, which is to say he is situated wherever there is a singularity, in all the series and in all the branches marked by a singular point, because he is himself this distance that transforms him into a woman, and at its terminal point he is already the mother of a new humanity and can finally die. So uh, the one thing I'll go back, uh, we'll just break this down. Uh, the thing he, they want to get across here very cleanly is that we aren't uh, doing the Hegelian antithesis synthesis shit. That this is not us finding the contradictions between two things, collapsing them and having something new. This is allowing the things to be as they are and allowing us to connect to both as we do when we, when we must. I, I'm not saying I or me, Jack. I'm just talking just generally about the signs that can exist and how we deal with the signifiers. This is instead that we affirm both positively. Uh, those of us in the logic of sense group, for example, are going right now through the paradoxes that he absolutely adores. That book came out prior to this. And you can see a great deal of that language inside of that book where he's talking about affirming two contradictory things and we're able to do it. That's actually how sense and language work. Uh, it's, a, it's a really fascinating uh, direction to take where it's not destroy man, destroy women. It's not, oh, well, we need to find out I'm sort of man, sort of woman. It's like, no, we, we all are all of them. Uh, and we're not both of them at the same time. We're moving between them as we necessarily do. Their use of the word transsexual here, I think, is uh, it's not, I think, our common parlance when we talk about uh, uh, trans people today, trans men, trans women. They're talking about it in the sense of like tr they're able to uh, transport between them. They're trans alive dead, trans parent child, uh, trans race, trans everything. We exist in that sort of we can exist in that place. This is the disjunction that they're kind of pushing us towards. I, I assume they mean trans like beyond here, beyond sexual, beyond race. Yeah, I, I wanted to, like, that, that's, I was trying to figure out the words for it, so thank you. Um, they, they exist outside of those signs. Yes, the trend, I was trying to think of the words, I couldn't, so thank you. It, it seems like here they're first identifying the uh, what they would late, they'll later call a line of flight, right? They're saying that a certain type of the disjunctive synthesis is being used as something to break away from these particular structures, um, and that the uh, the schizophrenic kind of does this automatically. Uh, they don't even have to think about doing it. Um, you know. Um, Schreiber does it all the time, right? Where he'll suddenly be God and then suddenly he'll be have a Jewish stomach or whatever, blah, blah, blah. People are trying to steal his thoughts. There's a sun going in his anus, etc. Like he's not beholden to categories like nationality or sexuality or gender or, or anything like that. And uh, that's the point at which the Oedipus is, is broken as well. Yeah, I like that a lot because that last bit is really important where they talk about the creation of, I guess, the middle point, but uh, he does not define himself. He does not confine himself inside contradictions. On the contrary, he opens out and, like a spore case inflated with spores, releases them as so many singularities that he had improperly shut off, some of which he intended to exclude while retaining others but which now become point signs, all affirmed by their new distance. So to your point about the beyond sexuality and all that, right? 
because it's all about the distance and the coordination of that distance, it doesn't fit into sexuality so as to deduce the sexuality, right? Sexuality in this sense is always produced as a distance. And in that sense, it's always beyond sexuality in like a, uh, a fit sense. Because normally, right, you would say it's a heterosexual use. Well, has it been produced that way? And if it's produced as a distance and that's a sign, our sign point, we have a different thing altogether, right? So it's kind of an inversion. The other bit is that because we're dealing with a point sign, that's a recording, right? In relation to the body without organs. And that does affirm a new distance. So like you're saying that that squares nicely with the idea of a line of escape there, or at least looking toward that line of escape. I mean, they're throwing a bit of shade here at Hegel as well. And the, the dialectic when, I mean, if we think about like the synth, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis, um, they're sort of implying that itself is like a restrictive structure, right? That, uh, that we're sort of abiding to, like it's very nicely partitioned, like it's its own triangle in a way. Um, and like these lines of flight are even outside of that relationship that Hegelians might like to think applies to anything. I, yeah, I mean, I'm always happy whenever anyone throws shade at Hegel. It's always fun. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to move to the next uh, paragraph unless anyone has any more comments on this. Uh, no, never mind. I'm good. All right. Uh, that is why the schizophrenic God has so little to do with the God of religion, even though they are related to the same syllogism. In Le Baphomet, Klesowski contrasts God as the master of the exclusions and restrictions that drive from the disjunctive sy syllogism, with an antichrist who is the prince of modifications, determining instead the passage of a subject through all possible predicates. I am God, I am not God. I am God, I am man. It is not a matter of a synthesis that would go beyond the negative disjunctions of the derived reality in an original reality of man-god, but rather of an inclusive disjunction that carries out the synthesis itself in drifting from one term to another and following the distance between terms. Nothing is primal. It is like the famous conclusion to Malloy, quote, It is midnight. The rain is beating on the windows. It was not midnight. It was not raining, end quote. Nijinsky wrote, quote, I am God, I was not God, I am a clown of God. I am Apis, I am an Egyptian, I am a Red Indian, I am a Negro, I am a Chinaman, I am a Japanese, I am a foreigner, a stranger, I am a seabird, I am a land bird, I am the tree of Tolstoy, I am the roots of Tolstoy, I am husband and wife in one, I love my wife, I love my husband, end quote. So to pose a question to the group, then what's happening with the disjunct? Because I think this is one of the one of the clearest senses we've got, uh, we've gotten of the synthesis this far. Uh, what's happening with the disjunctive synthesis here? What are they showing us? Well, so the the thing they're ultimately showing us. I'm just going to read what State Banjo wrote because it's I think very succinct. Uh, schizophrenics don't perceive a contradiction between holding different roles. The role is where they are at the moment, not what they are. Uh, I think that's a very clean and crisp way of putting it. Um, the, the roles that we have to play, it's the way it works, as we go through life, we're going to be switching around quite a bit. And it's, I, it's, it's a little different, I think, for us to deal with this and have this conversation today than it would have been 40 or 50 years ago or even 100 because roles over time have softened in comparison to what they were. Uh, uh, they're still there and they're still insidious and evil. Do not get me wrong. But the idea of, you know, a dad doing mom things, like there were comedies in the eighties that were starting to have this conversation. This is not new stuff. It's roles being a little bit more fungible. The representation and what they're talking about here is the terrifying part where it's the nature of representation to tell us prescriptively how we're supposed to behave, how we're supposed to think and how we're supposed to connect. And then anything outside of that simply is just not the way it's done. So a schizophrenic, as they talk about, makes do with the connections he's able to make at the time, the role he's playing as he's moving between things. Uh, the, the line there, the role is where they are at the moment, not what they are is pretty great. Um, 
because the R is the part that we're slowly trying to get away from because we aren't really very much. All right, I'll move to the next uh, paragraph. <clears throat> what counts is not parental designations, nor racial or divine designations, but merely the use made of them. No problem of meaning, but only of usage. Nothing original or derived, but a generalized drift. It would seem that the schizo liberates a raw genealogical material, non-restrictive, where he can situate himself, record himself, and take his bearings in all the branches at once, on all sides. He explodes the Oedipal genealogy. Through graduated relationships, he performs absolute overflights, spanning indivisible dif distances. The genealogist madman lays out a disjunctive network on the body without organs. And God, who designates none other than the energy of recording, can be the greatest enemy in the paranoiac inscription, but also the greatest friend in the miraculating inscription. In any case, the question of a being superior to man and to nature does not arise here at all. Everything is on the body without organs, both what is inscribed and the energy that inscribes it. On the ungen unengendered body, the non-decomposable distances are necessarily surveyed, while the disjoined terms are all affirmed. I am the letter, and the pen, and the paper. It was in this fashion that Nijinsky kept his diary. Yes, I was my father, and I was my son. It's a lovely and straightforward paragraph. Do I have to dive into this at all? Because it's one. It's not often that I just feel like I can just move on, because it's it's very crisp. The disjunctive synthesis of recording, therefore, leads us to the same result as the connective synthesis. It, too, is capable of two uses, the one imminent, the other transcendent. And here again, why does psychoanalysis reinforce the transcendent use that introduces exclusions and restrictions everywhere in the disjunctive network, and that makes the unconscious swing over into Oedipus? And why is Oedipalization precisely that? It is because the exclusive relation introduced by Oedipus comes into play not only between the various disjunctions conceived as differentiations, but between the whole of the differentiations that it imposes on an undifferentiated that it presupposes. Oedipus informs us, If you don't follow the lines of differentiation daddy-mommy-me and the exclusive alternatives that delineate them, you will fall into the black night of the undifferentiated. It should be made clear that the exclusive disjunctions are not at all the same as the inclusive disjunctions. Neither God nor the parental designations play the same role in the two. In exclusive disjunctions, parental appellations no longer designate intensive states through which the subject passes on the body without organs and in the unconscious that remains an orphan. Rather, they designate global persons who do not exist prior to the prohibitions that found them and they differentiate among these global persons and in relation to the ego, so that the transgression of the prohibition becomes correlatively a confusion of persons, where the ego identifies with the global persons with the loss of differentiating rules or differential functions. This is the paralogism. Am I right? Yeah, I think this is the second paralogism. Again, talking about how representation plays into things, and again, the, the the prescriptive nature of saying what we are or how we have to relate to things or connect, the either-or nature. Uh, if you don't follow the lines of differentiation, daddy, mommy, me, you become undifferentiated. There's a horror, a cosmic horror level to that psychically, where if I don't do these things, I will become a black hole of nothing, of ca pure chaos. And it's not true, but... You have to do these things. Anything else uh, is what is undifferentiated. There is only these three, this triangle. Try not to get too deep into difference and repetition and theory of difference here. Um, anyone want to try? So I think there's a few things to keep in mind as we're working through this then. Um, and then we'll give it to Ben to show us the, the call back to the first chapter. So Right, we, we're seeing the use of God here in two different capacities, right? The the God of Klazowski is Antichrist. And then we've got the God of like uh, more something like Oedipus, right? As sort of a master of the syllogism and that, which affects how the syllogisms are used, right? So we're talking about 
or rather we're talking about how the synthesis is used in two different manners. So the point I want to draw attention to is, and why is Oedipalization precisely that? It is because the exclusive relation introduced by Oedipus comes into play not only between the various disjunctions conceived as dis differentiations, emphasis, but between the whole of the differentiations that it imposes and an undifferentiated, unindifference that it presupposes. So that right there is obviously very important. And I think we should um, spend a little bit of time talking about what they mean there. Um, how I've read this, uh, I'll, I'll throw mine out, is the concept of, uh, let's say, known knowns and unknown knowns. Uh, it's a fun quadrant of stuff of kind of tracking how we understand things. No knowns are the differentiated. We are aware of them. Uh, I know that they exist. Uh, I, I can describe them. I can point at them. That's the, the known knowns. And you also have the unknown knowns. The things you have no idea exist that do. Uh, the way I've looked at the undifferentiated is more towards this latter sort of context. Uh, there's a, a con concept Plato had between forms that existed uh, called chroma. What was the term? We were using it in the logic of sense discussion. Jack, do you remember? You mean chronos? No, not chronos. Oh, I've been... Uh, I've been muted and talking for about 60 seconds. Wonderful. Um, Cora, C-H-O-R-A, is a term uh, Plato uh, utilized. Um, it's a, spelled with a K also. Um, it's a, whatever, it's an island off of whatever. It's, it's basically the receptacle, uh, the interval uh, between uh, cities, between ideas, between concepts. Uh, Derrida wrote about it uh, uh, as well. Um, so it feels like this is kind of towards that direction. It's the clearing where things can sort of emerge from in between forms. Uh, the nature of the way that they're talking about representation is slightly different, that the representation, as it's implied to us, we say, excellent, you need to be adipalized. You exist as one of these three things, not in between them. You exist in this triangulation. Anything outside of it is bad. Anything outside of it doesn't exist. And there is a, a psychic cosmic horror that comes with that that's very different, the part of the undifferentiated masses. And it's very important for us to not be undifferentiated. Like the nature of difference, the nature of identity, and all of those things very much encourages us and pushes towards that direction regardless. So the idea of being undifferentiated is almost like cosmic horror level for our psyche. Okay. And now let's watch, walk this into like the unconscious then. Because we're not just the psyche here, but like, because I, I like that you're bringing the mental health aspect. But if we apply that to, to the unconscious and libidinal flows, right? Kind of that circuitry they get into later on. So then we're seeing how uh, the machines that are working with desire, there's a way in which they're being imposed upon them, right? So as to function and produce in a certain manner, and to take on the functionality of, say, uh, father-son, right? And to produce within that capacity with your, of course, with your emphasis on the other side, which is to say, like, when it doesn't produce that way, right, it's, it's problematized. Or um, we have the problem of the undifferentiation, which you're calling, like, a, a cosmic horror here. And again, when we have things that are in representation, the last line here uh, imposes an undifferentiated that it presupposes. Uh, by having a representation that says a thing is a thing and nothing else, either or, it automatically presupposes that there is an undifferentiated mass that is almost nothing. When we instead deal with representations that are dealing with signs and sort of the random connected nature of it and an inclusive disjunction, there doesn't exist that same sort of problem because things are where they need to be and they are what they are and how they're connecting and all of that fun stuff. When we go the other direction and it's the representation, there is a darkness around it, just darkness. And that's the presupposition though, right? Because we're seeing how this undifferentiation 
the unconscious is, con is constantly producing so as to uh, create differentiation already, right? So this is where the presupposition comes in, is it doesn't even match how the unconscious produces, right? So this paralogism, and this will take us into Michael's question, this paralogism affects the capacities in their distribution of libidinal energy here, Newman, so as to produce and function in a certain manner, right? If we walk this now into relation with the first synthesis, so as to get at the, the question about global people, right? So if the first synthesis is working in such a way that um, partial objects become, uh, we have the problem of global persons. So we have the first synthesis introducing like something like global people or um, instead of dealing with partial objects like the breast, you're dealing with the mother now. So not only do you have like what appears to be a whole, but you've got a like a sort of totality you know, I'm going to be careful. They're not totality. You've got an object of a totality in the sense here. That well, functions the, the representation has a, the representation has a full shape. It, it it operates as an entire thing. So if I say, for example, uh, Michael, if I go, you need to be a better, you need to be a father. Like just the power behind that sentence. If if you if you know how I'm saying it, it's like, ooh, I need to be a. So what's a father? Well, uh, I've fathered a child. I have. He's downstairs running around. I, I have never spanked him and I don't intend to, but a good father knows how to discipline. It, a father, the father, a concept of the father in this representation creates a relation that is whole, that is that didn't exist before. Uh, if I teach Dexter, excellent, I'm your father, you do as I say, that creates a global person. That's not, hey, uh, I'm this guy who you're living with who's taking care of you and loves you very much. I'm your father. You will do as I say. Your mother, you must be obedient to, and you must behave this certain way. The, that creates global persons that we need to either emulate, we need to include, we need to deal with in our psyches, but this is not how we operate. It, it include, increases that, it includes that sort of exclusive disjunction, where now father means the one who... Uh, deals with punishment and the law, especially in sort of the tradition of the terms in the Oedipal complex. The mother is the carrying, fairly, you know, passive sort of side that I end up wanting to fuck, but I have to fight my father and then I have to go visit that poor, visit that energy on some other poor woman someday. That global persons didn't exist prior to this. Like the, the, the dude, the, the guy who donated sperm and raised a person, yes, that person exists. The father did not. That's the difference. So it's the, the global person of the father or the... Thank you. Yeah, it makes sense. All right, good. It's a it's a tough thing to... Because when you start breaking this down, and we're going to get into this, especially in three, but very much in four, as we start talking about how representations work and what we're actually invested in, when you start realizing how many of your things are... How many representations are essentially stories that are wrapped into a single word and global persons who you think exists the the president of america great example uh that's i mean if, if we we've had one for the last five years two different ones that prove that that's not like a thing that that's just a name we call some asshole so but but a hundred years ago he was president you must you must care for such a thing you do you understand he's the president would be the idea of an archetype too right not exactly, because the thing we're missing here is how you get the global person. And so to walk this out to the final point, on page 73, they write, there we have a curious paralogism implying a transcendent use of the syntheses of the unconscious. We pass from detachable partial objects to the detached complete object from which global persons derive by an assigning of lack. For example, in the capitalist code and its trinitary expression, money as detachable chain is converted into capital as detached object, which exists only in the fetishist view of stocks and lats. So what makes the father or the president or these global persons possible is the detachment of a complete, uh, is a detached complete object. So I think of the phallus here because I think it's just an easier one to think of. But when you have the phallus detached, and they even start out uh, the section we're reading with this example, right? There's a way in which things are um, 
global persons can be created through that detached part, um, for, uh, object, right? So a phallus becomes a way of having things like mother, father, because they work in relation, or those roles, however you like to think about them here, work in relation to that uh, transcendent object, which is lacked in the assemblage. Yeah, it's uh, then the other side, which is the the cosmic horror side, the the nothingness, the, the the undifferentiated, comes through when we start talking about actual behavior. So if I say, for we'll use the father example, and then I'll give another one. If I say uh, I am a dad, I I've got a kid, and I'm fine with not being a father, like holy shit, that sentence alone, like put me on Mori Povich, like that's a weird sentence to say, and it immediately puts me in a place of. Well, I'm going to be this undifferentiated masses. I want to be a dad. I love this kid. I, I do. So how do I, what? Like, so I need to be a father. And here's how you do that. Um, my, my dad, my dad always gives me my favorite examples of this because he's a weird hyper traditionalist uh, with some weird beliefs. Um, I got, a, I had a great job where my title was vice president and uh, I was on a meeting. My dad happened to be visiting and I was swearing a lot and I had my beard long. And afterwards he goes, you know, vice presidents don't talk like that and they don't have, they shave their, they shave their beards off. He said this to me and I went, technically no, cause I'm a vice president and I was swearing and I have a beard. Um, but that's the, the prescriptive sort of odd nature to the whole thing that these words mean that it's not that these things mean the same thing for everyone, it, but they do have a generalized, uh, I will use Delusian terms. There is a common sense around what a father is. Absolutely. Uh, now, in different cultures, it means different things. They'll get into how Oedipus recreates the hierarchy of capital and the nuclear family through imperialism uh, in a really, really brutal way. Um, but there's a reason that we all kind of know when I say, uh, especially people here, uh, you need to be a father. Eh, kind of works kind of everywhere, uh, especially the Oedipalized version of it. Things have been fucked up. Short version. Uh, anything before I move on to the next paragraph? Yeah, to respond to Michael, I like the question you're asking there about how can it mean the same thing. But this is the this is kind of a difficulty in what they're um, posing with these uses, right? So with the, the again, I like the use of the phallus because I think it's the easy one to go for. With the phallus detaching as a complete uh, whole object, right? That influences the process of production. Yeah, so with that influencing the process of production, that's going to then carry over as like a toward like a master signifier, right? And then functionalities will uh, be supposed in a certain manner in that sense. And this gives us the exclusive use as opposed to the body without organs um, creating that intensive process that gives you those uh, those states on it as opposed to like uh, predisposed functionalities or functionalities that should be doing as opposed to the ones that are being created, right? Which is, it's passing through as opposed to um, being imposed upon. So with that, it's not simply the question of the meaning, it's how it functions here. Because in these syntheses, it's going to affect how the body of the organs then produces and how the unconscious is producing itself through the process of generation and regeneration. But we should stress the fact that Oedipus creates both the differentiations that it orders and the undifferentiated with which it threatens us. With the same movement, the Oedipus complex inserts desire into triangulation and prohibits desire from satisfying itself with the terms of the triangulation. It forces desire to take as its object the differentiated parental persons and brandishing the threats of the undifferentiated prohibits the correlative ego from satisfying its desires with these persons in the name of the same requirements of differentiation. But it is this undifferentiated that Oedipus creates as the reverse of the differentiations that it creates. Oedipus says to us, either you will internalize the differential functions that rule over the exclusive disjunctions and thereby resolve Oedipus, or you will fall into the neurotic night of imaginary identifications. Either you will follow the lines of the triangle, lines that structure and differentiate the three terms, 
or you will always bring one term into play as if it were one too many in relation to the other two, and you will reproduce in every sense the dual relations of identification in the undifferentiated. But there is Oedipus on either side, and everybody knows what psychoanalysis means by resolving Oedipus, internalizing it so as to better rediscover it on the outside, in social authority, where it will be made to proliferate and be passed on to the children. Quote, the child becomes a man only by resolving the Oedipus complex, whose resolution introduces him into society, where he finds within the figure of authority the obligation to relive it, this time with no way out. Nor is it by any means certain that, between the impossible return to that which precedes the stage of culture and the growing malaise that this stage provokes, a point of equilibrium can be found. End quote. Oedipus is like the labyrinth. You only get out by re-entering it, or by making someone else enter it. Oedipus, as either problem or solution, is the two ends of the ligature that cuts off all desiring production. The screws are tightened, nothing relating to production can make its way through any longer, except for a far distant murmur. The unconscious has been crushed, triangulated, and confronted with a choice that is not its own. With all the exits now blocked, there is no longer any possible use for the inclusive, non-restrictive disjunctions. Parents have been found for the orphan unconscious. Uh, another great paragraph. Uh, it's wonderful. Uh, any comments, questions on it? Uh, super open. Would love to hear all your thoughts. Um, while we're waiting, um, I just want to call it two things then, at least to get it started then. That last sentence, I think, is a really nice way of thinking about the paralogisms in relation to syllogisms. Parents have been found for the orphan unconscious, right? And that way you see how the, the paralogism is affecting the unconscious production, um, but also how it, its perspective on the unconscious. So then to give us a passage, then what do you guys make of this? But it is this undifferentiated that Oedipus creates as the reverse of the differentiations that it creates creates. Oedipus says to us, either you will internalize the differential functions that rule over the exclusive disjunctions and thereby resolve Oedipus, or you will fall into the neurotic night of imaginary identifications. I just uh, love this paragraph. Um, still open. If everyone seems to be uh, quite unable to chat. That's fine. Um, but I, I, the thing that they're introducing as this part of it in, in this section is that they're now bringing desire, libidinal desire, into this. That it's no longer just them talking about, hey, here is the apparatus of a thing, here is the triangulation, here's how we become and we relate to these things as a subject. But instead, now, actually, this is where desire comes in. And desire gets stamped, destroyed, and shit out by this triangle uh, as we get going. And... Uh, basically crushes us in a desire pathway we never had in the first place. It's a fantastic paragraph. Mm -hmm. But to add on to that, right, there is a point here we got to understand that Oedipus still does have a way of affecting differentiations, right? So this is kind of the interesting thing is that as the machines are producing in this manner, there still is a process of uh, flow differentiation and all that, which is kind of at stake here. Yeah, the way it's um, the way those uh, productions function and how we're going to understand, or rather, how they should function, is kind of the one of the aspects of that stakeage here. Cool. I'm going to continue to the next paragraph, which is the uh, double bind. I mean, it starts with those words. <clears throat> double bind is the term used by Gregory Bateson to describe the simultaneous transmission of two kinds of messages one of which contradicts the other, as, for example, the father who says to his son, go ahead, criticize me, but strongly hints that effective criticism, at least a certain type, will be very unwelcome. Bateson sees in this phenomenon a particularly schizophrenizing situation, which he interprets as a contrary from the viewpoint of Russell's theory of types. It seems to us that the double mind, the double impasse, is instead a common situation. By, be, by Oedipalizing... Bedipalizing? What is the word there in the original book? I should have the original text. Sometimes this uh, screws up. Uh, I've got where, where are you? 
is instead a common situation edipalizing par excellence. All right. It's, I've, I've got bedipalizing on the stupid whatever. That's not even a word. I will read that sentence. I, I think that one's written by the My Pillow guy. There we go. My Pillow, uh, he is edipalized, so that works. Uh, it seems to us that the double bind, the double impasse, is instead a common situation, edipalizing par excellence. And although it would require formalization, the other type of nonsense spoken of by Russell is brought to mind by the double bind situation. An alternative, an exclusive disjunction is defined in terms of a principle which, however, constitutes its two terms as under or underlying holes, and where the principle itself enters into the alternative, a completely different case from what happens when the disjunction is inclusive. Here we have the second paralogism of psychoanalysis. In short, the double bind is none other than the whole of Oedipus. It is in this sense that Oedipus should be presented as a series or an oscillation between two poles, the neurotic identification and the internalization that is said to be normative. On either side is Oedipus, the double impasse. And if a schizo is produced here as an entity, this occurs for the simple reason that there is no means of escaping this double path, where normality is no less blocked than neurosis, where the solution offers no more of a way out than does the problem, hence the schizo's withdrawal to the body without organs. It seems that Freud himself was acutely aware of Oedipus's inseparability from a double impasse into which he was precipitating the unconscious. Thus, in the 1936 letter to Romain Rolland, Freud writes, quote, Everything unfolds as if the essential were to go beyond the father, as if going beyond the father were always forbidden, end quote. This becomes even more clear when Freud elaborates the entire historico-mythical series. At one end, the Oedipal bond is established by the murderous identification. At the other end, it is reinforced by the restoration and internalization of paternal authority. Revival of the old state of things at a new level. Between the two, there is latency, the celebrated latency, which is without doubt the greatest psychoanalytic mystification. This society of brothers who forbid themselves the fruits of the crime and spend all the time necessary for internalizing. But we were warmed. The society of brothers is very dejected, unstable, and dangerous. It must prepare the way for the rediscovery of an equivalent to a parental authority. It must cause us to pass over to the other pole. In accord with a suggestion of Freud's, American society, the industrial society with anonymous management and vanishing personal power, is presented to us as a resurgence of the society without the father. Not surprisingly, the industrial society is burdened with the search for original modes for the restoration of equivalent. For example, the astonishing discovery by Mr. Lick that the British royal family, after all, is not such a bad thing. So this paragraph opens very seemly with them talking about the double impasse as a thing even Freud himself was quite aware of, that there is the desire, it's a, it feels as if one must go beyond the father, that there is more out there but you can't because it's terrifying and forbidden. Uh, that he was very aware of this and even wrote about it is a little bit of their point, that this has been built in from the beginning, that there is more outside of there, there is more to believe in, there's more to do than just be father, mother, me, but it's forbidden and not allowed. And this is the double bind. And um, like I said, if you're not going to be a father, but you have a child, then what are you? I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of the feeling. Uh, it's, it's haunting. It's haunting when you have a kid or in anything. If you're going to be a homosexual, but a member of, you know, America, if you're going to be black and you're going to be successful, like these things are taught to us as the racist, homophobic, shitty, weird, hyper-representational country. You don't have options. You either fall in line or you are otherized. And the otherization is nothing. And it's scary as shit. That's actually a great question. State Banjo asks, and I don't have the background in it, latency and the mystification of it? So let's our, work our way into latency. And I'll give Ken uh, a chance that if he can't talk, he can maybe write a little bit in the, the chat. But the, the thing I want to hit real quick as we're going into latency is that this point about Freud realizing this, right? With the way the double pass works or the double bind works here, right? There's a way in which it's restrictive so as to coordinate flows a certain way, right? 
or at least it tries to coordinate them. So this is the point about getting stuck or blockages in the unconscious, right? The unconscious continues producing as it is, but the paralogism here is trying to affect and sort of narrow those flows, coordinating them through certain functionalisms, right? So as to be productive under the uh, yoke of Oedipus, as they say. So with that, what, what Freud's calling out here, <clears throat> or rather what I see them calling out with Freud in relation to what Brooks is talking about is how the Oedipal relationship is a condition of how things progress in society at a molar level, right? So just like you're saying with transgression, yeah, the, the so I'm going to jump a little bit ahead just to make the point with the displacement of desire in this manner or the coordination of flows in this manner to bring it back to this junct of syllogism. Uh, what's happening then is that the Oedipal relationship becomes kind of the condition for how things should function and how things get deferred from the way they would otherwise be produced. So with that, Ken, take us into latency. Um, I just now sat back down. <clears throat> um, latency? I I'm not sure what in uh, relation to. So latency is like, what? It's like... Like Freudian uh, right, latency. Right, yeah, yeah, it's right before the, the phallic stage. Or is it after? It was right before, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so it's supposed to be like a period in time where you have some sort of like relief from the Oedipal complex. I mean, yeah, uh, repression is working well. So, yeah, and someone uh, asked the question earlier, like, is the double bind also that Oedipus ends up being the solution to Oedipus? And I think you can see that in... Uh, in this idea of latency and in the idea of foreclosure. Um, so the idea is that, you know, uh, things go wrong when you aren't, when repression, it doesn't work or things go wrong when disclosure doesn't work or things go wrong when disavowal doesn't work. Um, so yeah, it makes up this like all encompassing axiomatic um, that you introject. And now like, <clears throat> now you're this, um, there's you're the subject produced off of like an edible edible line machine line or whatever yeah the, the latency is an awkward term in english because i think in french it has i mean i mean in french everything has like a million meanings i've uh generally referred to it as the latent stage so it's like the first is whatever it's phallic stage comes right before where essentially subjectivization happens where um Oedipus complex in boys comes out and then the girls have their own version of that. Uh, but it's not sexual. It's uh, you're aware of your organs and you're aware that you don't have organs if you're a girl. And that essentially becomes some kind of subjectivization followed by the latent stage, which is basically as soon as that happens, you need to start teaching a child not to desire things and how to behave and how to be properly Oedipalized. And that goes until the kid starts becoming sexually uh, it, it, puberty basically uh, and then in puberty the genital stage starts and generally that's like where the assumption in Freud is kind of like this is where you get to start acting out those things and uh, uh, you, you're fucked up if you do the wrong stuff it's like basically prior to puberty is when the good work needs to be done and the latent stage is more latent than latency latency means slow or delayed in English parlance, not so much there. Latent, uh, like uh, <laughs> latently uh, anything, means kind of hidden, repressed, hidden back. Uh, and that's kind of what the stage is more about, is about repressing and hiding those things. And that's why they're laughing about it here, where they're like, between the two, there is celebrated latency, which is a doubt, the greatest psychoanalytic mystification. This idea that, uh, as they call it, brothers, oh, it's, we're all brothers and we all care. We're all people, but oh my God, we all also want to do these horrifying things. We better make a bunch of laws and stop ourselves. To... Oh no, we don't have a, a, a leader. We better find a leader. We need a dad is kind of what the latent stage is. Um, yeah. And then just a quick side note, um, that, uh, that prohibition predicates desire on 
the transgression of that prohibition. So it's like whenever you tell a kid to stop masturbating or something that it's dirty and bad and whatnot, they're going to like, that's going to just egg it on more. And now they're going to associate masturbation with dirty and bad stuff and like have a higher propensity to make it so-called what their judgment would be as dirty and bad masturbation. And the same goes with sexuality, you know? Yeah. And that's a Freud's big thing is about, taking all of that sexual energy that's going to be coming as soon as a child hits puberty and sublimating it into, I think he said homework, which just, just is like the lamest thing you could, Hey, we don't want them to have sex. Let's put that energy into homework is like, Jesus Christ. Um, I mean, that's it. Am I wrong? Like, I feel like I'm oversimplifying, but then again, I also hate a lot of Freud. So it's tough for me to say <laughs> if I'm just being an ass or if I'm oversimplifying. I have a little bit of a different take on wait and see here. And I think this connection will help make it, um, make, make this really apparent, right? So we saw how we're the distance in between in the process of production, right? And when I say we, I mean the assemblage, right? That which is being um, produced in the unconscious has the distance in between these uh, either or, or, ors is, uh, that's where the, the production of that is happening, right? That's where the, the subjectivities and intensities are. In contrast to losing watery, right? Latency is in between um, during the paralogisms, right? So the interesting thing here is if latency is the in-between, and I think you guys are putting your thumb on it rather nicely. If latency is the in-between, right? It begins to appear as the, so that's what it was, right? Or more so, it's the capacities that are being, um, that are part of the exclusive disjunction in that manner. So when they write, this becomes even more clear when Freud elaborates the entire historical mythical series that one end the Oedipal bond is established by the murderous identification. At the other end, it is reinforced by the restoration and internalization of parental authority, revival of the old state of things at a new level. Between the two, there is latency, the celebrated latency, which is without doubt the greatest psychoanalytic mystification. The society of brothers who forbid themselves the fruit of the crime and spend all the time necessary for internalizing. So right at this level, we're seeing how people are being produced in these roles, right? And the latency that kind of constitutes the functionalities and even later on the subjectivities, right? that becomes the distance in between where we uh where it begins to appear that that's what the unconscious uh should be doing right that's how it should be um, being produced in that manner with the tension of the blockage right so it's kind of like it to me it kind of explains how even something like sublimation can be argued for in psychoanalysis it gives us an idea of where where latency comes from and where the ways we deal with latency would come from. Uh, I'm going to continue to the next paragraph. Uh, it is therefore understood that we leave one pole of Oedipus only to pass on to the other. No way of getting out, neurosis or normality. The Society of Brothers rediscovers nothing of production and desiring machines. On the contrary, it spreads the veil of latency. As to those who refuse to be oedipalized in one form or another, at one end or the other in the treatment, the psychoanalyst is there to call the asylum or the police for help. The police on our side. Never did psychoanalysis better display its taste for supporting the movement of social repression and for participating in it with enthusiasm. Let it not be thought that we are alluding to the folkloric aspects of psychoanalysis. The fact that there are some, around Lacan, who are developing another conception of psychoanalysis does not mean that we should take no notice of the dominant tone in the most respected associations. Consider Dr. Mendel and the Dr. Stefan. The state of fury that is theirs and their literally police-like appeal at the thought that someone might claim to escape the Oedipal dragnet. Oedipus is one of those things that becomes all the more dangerous the less people believe in it. Then the cops are there to replace the high priests. The first profound example of an analysis of double bind in this sense can be found in Marx's On the Jewish Question Between the Family and the State, the Oedipus of Familial Authority and the Oedipus of Social Authority. 
I really like this because again, they're starting to go into the 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 divergence that they are unhappy about throughout the entire book is the separation of our unconscious, the idea of that our minds work a certain way, and then we have to deal with society, which is its own thing. Uh, they're trying to collapse that into basically understanding that production's production and operates kind of across the board. This idea that, uh, for example, their line strikes true with me where they say, the less one believes in it, the more dangerous it is, uh, which I think we can see very clearly in, let's say, America or France. Uh, I've, I've seen how your police work, uh, or a lot of countries throughout Europe. America is the best at this, though, uh, that we've allowed police to take on that role. We may not necessarily talk about Oedipus in the same way, but the hierarchies and the way that people are supposed to be or ought to handle or the roles that are intended for them are still very much the daddy, mommy, me triangle. Only now we have the police to handle it. And the idea, we've gone so far that the idea that we would send uh, healthcare workers or mental health professionals to deal with people that the police are going after or who get called uh, is actually seen as a radical leftist thing. So that's good. Um, but you always want to be very careful there because of the role of global persons. The cops take on a function in relation to the Oedipal disjunction the same way that those um, social workers can, because it's going to be a changing of the guard, so to speak. Yes, I'm more just saying that there's, I'm more talking about how their point about how the less people believe in it, the more dangerous it becomes, that we've gone so far out that we can't even like have the slightly less shitty version of incredibly shitty. Like, I'm not saying that we should be sending mm -hmm. healthcare workers along. I think the whole thing's insane, but like just even we, we have no choice but to send police, which is absurd to me that like anything less than absolute police dragnets is considered to be crazy left-wing shit because these people who are getting called on these homeless people, the house, the unhoused, the mentally ill, the, the gays, the trans, the prostitutes, the sex workers, the drug addicts, the undesirables of society deserve police just right away. Because let's be fair, they're not fitting into the daddy, mommy, me triangle. And that's the way it goes is uh, terrifying, actually. You're spot on there. The one thing I would add is they do fit in in this manner, though. Because this is what global persons in this uh, this disjunct uh, disjunction do, right? It's a way of placing people into that, or rather placing the desires, right, at the molar level, uh, particularly, into that, those functions and that um, territoriality, right? That's the scary thing about it is with the, you know, whether you change the, what the who, who is in the role of the father there, or you change who is in the role of the child, you're changing who is just standing in for those roles, right? You're actually still working in those transcend, uh, transcendent paralogisms. And that's the difficulty. Any questions, comments on this paragraph before I move on? Yeah, I'd like to ask a question, actually, if that's all Please. right. Oh, of course. Um, when they say dangerous in this context, I'm curious if... Uh, someone could elaborate on what exactly they mean where dangerous in terms of some idea of, you know, human liberty or dangerous in terms of the its capacity to unleash violence. So what do they mean when they say that the less people believe in the idea of Oedipus, the more dangerous it becomes? I believe that they're looking at it directly in terms of physical violence, but I think it goes across the board. Uh, so Let's go back when their time. If everyone believed that Oedipus was a thing, then the way we would handle it is everyone would just go to their psychoanalyst, get properly shrunk, properly triangulated, and then off they'd go. And that's that sucks in a lot of ways, but that's not as bad and dangerous as it can get when people stop going. And when society goes, well, you know, we really don't need that. But these, these non-Oedipalized people, I mean, who the fuck are they? We need to do something to get rid of them. So as that crumbles, and as they point out here, what happens is psychoanalysts start utilizing the police to bring people in and force them to asylums. Well, what's the next step? Well, as soon as people aren't even talking about asylums, let's say in a country where they've abolished the idea of asylums and they've completely eliminated mental health care across the board, who deals with this stuff? And it's the police with guns, uh, very often just flat out killing them. So I think that's the line. 
Now, on the pure spiritual side of things, I think they also mean dangerous in that sense, too, because the more oppressive and the more brutal it becomes, uh, also the more dangerous it becomes uh, psych- psychologically as well. But- I see. So in a way, it's dangerous in the sense that an edible Oedipus creates this kind of like toxic cocktail of psychic forces that it both you know, tries to contain and also to channel for purposes of social harmony, but not very well. It needs the first line of defense of uh, of, of, of an analysis to, to enforce those kinds of um, lines and codes. Yeah, as, as let's talk about, and Jack, I know, just let me talk about individuals for a second. As individuals become uh, Oedipalized or they have that sort of underlying structure built into their unconscious like this, the daddy, mommy, me, nuclear family, which capitalism absolutely does, hierarchy, which capitalism absolutely does. As those become built into individuals, en masse, individuals uh, want that to continue. They are scared of the undifferentiated. It's the nature of this type of representation. They don't want to be undifferentiated uh, the same way that someone who's a trans individual breaking down gender norms is dangerous and scary to someone who believes in them very deeply. Their representations and their personal identity is so gauged in this very specific set and this very set of lines that anything outside of that is uh, anathema to my own continued psychic existence as it is, and therefore undifferentiated, therefore terrifying. So my incentive as just a natural sort of psychic existence is to not like those people and want to do things or help. Maybe even I can coach it in helping them if I'm a good liberal, but I want those people to be fixed one way or another. And as on, at large, people are naturally Oedipalized, even if they don't talk about Oedipus, uh, but they believe in the same core triangulated structure and hierarchy, they're encouraged to continue to push people towards fixing that. This is why people are perfectly fine constantly, even during a pandemic, uh, with the idea of homeless camps uh, being completely destroyed, burned, and wrecked, because we got to make sure that those people know they can't just be doing this thing. They, they need to be a person like we are, a whole global person like I'm trying to be. Why aren't they trying to be the same thing? Uh, this is kind of how that gets out of hand very quickly, and you you can otherize people as part of it. So it's it's not so much... Oedipus specifically, but the nature of Oedipus and how it forces us into this triangulated rep- representation. Be a good citizen means to be properly, um, to be properly uh, uh, regulated, to be properly uh, uh, inhibited. Yes, to be, uh, they would use the term Oedipalized. I think um, common parlance now, I don't think they would even use the same term these days. Uh, this is my belief. I'm now moving into opinion. I don't think they'd use the same term. The nature of Oedipus and how the hierarchical structure and representation within capital works, we don't need Oedipus. Like, Oedipus is uh, an example of this and a symptom, but my dad doesn't believe in Oedipus at all, and he'd think I was silly if I brought it up. Like, it's a terminology that's older, that doesn't really fit today. But if I were to talk about the nuclear family and the need for a man and a woman to be married or to have a hierarchy at work or that I need to contribute to society— These are all part of that because of the global persons of father, mother, and me that are put into each of us just in general as society moves forward. And because of that, as I see things that are not fitting into mommy, daddy, me, they become the undifferentiated masses, which is a little like a Thulu level cosmic horror because you don't fit into my understanding of what I need to be. And therefore that's bad. It's scary. It's actually like psychically scary. Well, that's the other thing is that it seems like this kind of, um, you know, the threat, the double bind, when it threatens this kind of social ego death is only, it only works on people who have internalized these kinds of structures. Yeah, I think, I think they'll make that point. They talk about uh, how like Oedipalization necessarily, uh, in like colonized places, uh, Africa especially didn't really take off until it was really heavily enforced by the colonizers. Like it, it took like generations for uh, them to make that like an internalized part of those cultures because it's like so foreign. But I don't know. 
uh I, that, that that's like deeper into chapter three i don't want to like jump too far ahead into the book but i think they do uh address that point a little later on for sure uh, i'm going to read the next two paragraphs uh back to back because it's one is making a point and then one is adding a little bit of a layer to that oedipus is completely useless except for tying off the unconscious on both sides we shall see in what sense oedipus is strictly undecidable as the mathematicians would put it we are extremely tired of those stories where one is said to be in good health because of Oedipus, sick from Oedipus and suffering from various illnesses under the influence of Oedipus. It sometimes happens that an analyst becomes fed up with this myth that is the bed and board of psychoanalysis and goes back to the sources. Freud never managed to escape the world of the father or of guilt while offering the possibility of constructing a logic of relation to the father. He was the first to open the way for a release from the father's hold on man. The possibility of living beyond the father's law, beyond all law, is perhaps the most essential possibility brought forth by Freudian psychoanalysis. But paradoxically, and perhaps because of Freud, everything leads us to conclude that this release, made possible by psychoanalysis, will be achieved, is already being achieved outside it. We cannot, however, share either this pessimism or this optimism for there is much optimism in thinking psychoanalysis makes possible a veritable solution to oedipus oedipus is like god the father is like god the problem is not resolved until we do away with both the problem and the solution it is not the purpose of schizoanalysis to resolve oedipus it does not intend to resolve it better than oedipal psychoanalysis does it aims to de the unconscious in order to reach the real problems. Schizoanalysis proposes to reach those regions of the orphan unconscious, indeed, beyond all law, where the problem of Oedipus can no longer even be raised. By the same token, we do not share the pessimism that consists in thinking that this change, this release, can be achieved only outside psychoanalysis. We believe, on the contrary, in the possibility of an internal reversal that would make the analytic machine into an indispensable part of the revolutionary machinery. What is more, the objective conditions for such a practice appear to be already present. Oh yeah, I mean, you, the fourth chapter is basically that, is what we just said, is spread out over the course of far too many pages. But you're already in it. Them going through these paralogisms, I mean, this is what they're, this is exactly what they're talking about. Yeah, the idea of uh, something being a representation and understanding that existing as a global person. We don't deal with global persons in schizoanalysis, they might say. They would say, bypass that. We're not here to talk about, oh, you, you had a bad relationship with your father. Let's, is that why you don't get along with your boss? That's not it at all. They would say, excellent. Now let's keep going deeper. Let's Let's find the partial objects, the little bits, the way you're connecting to things, the representations you think you believe in and you understand or the ones you don't even know you're aware of which uh the latter is the pain in the ass uh for sure well i'm thinking schizoanalysis deals with them insofar as it's looking at the paralogistic uses that affect production uh, i would recommend on that uh holland has an excellent uh analysis of anti Oedipus and goes through the paralogisms uh, one by one, breaking them down sourced, and it's excellent. It's excellent and concise and a really great way. I think we've only gotten through the second paralogism right now. Am I correct on that? Or we've only done the second one right now? The we first the paralogism was in the last chapter. That's right. Correct. Yeah, so we're only on the second. We've got two more to go. I will continue to the next uh, paragraph, though. <clears throat> Everything takes place as if Oedipus of itself had two poles. One pole char characterized by imaginary figures that lend themselves to a process of identification, and a second pole characterized by symbolic functions that lend themselves to a process of differentiation. But in any case, we are Oedipalized. If we don't have Oedipus as a crisis, we have it as a structure. Then the crisis is passed on to others, and the whole movement starts all over again. Such is the Oedipal disjunction, the swing of the pendulum, the exclusive inverse reasoning. That is why, when we are invited to go beyond a simplistic conception of Oedipus based on parental images, in order to define symbolic functions within a structure, 
It is in vain that the traditional daddy-mommy are replaced by a mother function, a father function. We don't quite see what there is to gain by this, except for the founding of the universality of Oedipus beyond the variability of images, the fusing of desire even more strongly to law and prohibitions, and the pushing of the process of Oedipalization of the unconscious to its limits. Here Oedipus encounters its two extremes, its minimum and its maximum, depending on whether it is regarded as tending toward an undifferentiated value of its variable images, or towards the force of differentiation of its symbolic functions. Quote, when one draws nearer to the material imagination, the differential function diminishes, one tends toward equivalences. When one draws nearer to the formative elements, the differential function increases, one tends toward distinctive valences. End quote. It will hardly come as a surprise to learn that Oedipus as a structure is the Christian trinity, whereas Oedipus as a crisis is a familial trinity insufficiently structured by faith. Always the two poles in inverse proportion, Oedipus forever. To read the footnote, uh, see J.M. Poya. This article contains a perfect formulation of Oedipus's double bind. Quote, the psychic life of man unfolds in a sort of dialectical tension between two ways of living the Oedipus complex, one that consists in living it, and the other that consists in living according to the structures that might be called Oedipal. Experience also shows us that these structures are not foreign to the most critical phase of the complex. For Freud, man is definitively marked by this complex. It constitutes both his grandeur and his misery. Yeah, I feel like uh, in chapter one we had a we had a small discussion if the Oedipal was used as a Christian, uh, like as a how do you call it a metaphor for the Christian Trinity, but here they say it very explicitly. Um, it's so I don't think it's a metaphor. I mean, I think it's Oedipus functions in the way the Christian Trini Trinity does. Yes, yeah, sorry, indeed. I was searching for words and I ended up with metaphor, but I like it better how you said. Right, because it's the same way that God is the master of the disjunctive syllogism and the way that there's a trinity or triangulation there, like with the holy family. Yeah, th there is a parallel there. Do we have time for me to say something real fast or are you trying to move on? Please, no, let's go. Um, So, like, the, the two issues that it seems like Freud himself was trying to work out, you know, especially in uh, beyond the pleasure principle, is um, is this problem of the last instance um, and this problem of like mastery. Um, so that that issue of the last in instance is what brings one circling back to like Daddy, Mommy, Me, where you say something like like the primal scene is is some actual memory that was so traumatic that it's now totally repressed and then what repetition compulsion is an attempt to master that um but that doesn't work um whenever you play it out uh because then what you get is um repetition um like that that what repetition is trying to do is repeat a uh i mean not a stimulus isn't the right word but repeat this last instance that you weren't able to master and then uh later on the, the development becomes that there there is no last instance and that you can like enter in anywhere in in repetition and that what repetition is uh and, and that there is a there is like a repetition in repetition itself and that's what's being repeated not this last instance or this primordially repressed thing of like i can't fuck my mother but i want to or something like that and uh i hear y'all always saying that like um what Deleuze and Guattari are doing are going beyond these issues yeah uh, sidestepping them and going the problem the problem freud had is he had to solve it within his own setup if the uh, what's the joke um if we use reason to talk about like debate whether or not reason's good 
then reason is its own ref- referee. Of course, reason's going to win. And I think mm-hmm. if Oedipus is how we judge whether Oedipus is true, I mean, that's stacking the deck a little bit. Um, I will I will continue the next paragraph. Thank you for that, Ken. Uh, how many interpretations of Lacanism, uh, Lacanism, overtly or secretly pious, as the case may be, have in this manner invoked a structural Oedipus to create and shut the double impasse, to lead us back to the question of father, to Oedipalize even the schizo, and to show that a gap in the symbolic would bring us back to the imaginary, and inversely, that imaginary drivel or confusions would lead us to the structure. As a famous predecessor said to these creatures, you've already made this into an old refrain. As for us, that is why we were unable to posit any difference in nature, any borderline, any limit at all between the imaginary and the symbolic, or between Oedipus as crisis and Oedipus as structure, or between the problem and its solution. Its solution It is solely a question of the correlative double impasse, a swing of the pendulum responsible for sweeping away the entire unconscious, and that continuously carries us from one pole to the other, a double pincher action that crushes the unconscious caught in its exclusive disjunction. Uh, Is it Lacanism or Lacanism? I need to ask that because I've now said it wrong five different ways, and I'm just really asking. Lacanism? Lacanism sounds terrible. His name is Lacan, right? So Lacanism. It just sounds awful. English is an awkward language. Lacanianism. Lacanianism? Lac- is that what you just said? Lacanianism? What? Now you people are just giving shit to me. You people are. I like when you say Lacanism because it's a, it's a bit of a double entendre. Ah. Ah, yes, that was intentional too. I certainly wasn't doing that by accident. Was it some kind of Lacanian slip? Ah, okay, okay, that's enough Lacan puns for now. Um, go ahead, Jack. Just, just had an insight, which means I get a cookie. This is from 281. From the standpoint, and I realize I'm jumping around a little bit, bear with me for a minute. From the standpoint of the universe with clinical theory. Paranoia and schizophrenia can be presented as two extreme oscillations of a pendulum, oscillating around the position of the socius as a full body and at the limit of a body without organs, one of whose size is occupied by the molar aggregates and the other populated by molecular elements. So you see how they're talking about the double bind here? This point about the pendulum, if you were to jump to 282 and see those two diagrams, the very famous ones. The top one is a pendulum. I get the sense that they're making a a consistent reference to that. Well, yeah, I think we, when we talk about the paranoid and the schizophrenic, again, I don't think they're they're not talking about it in terms of uh, the hyperclinical definitions or even what we would call in that today, uh, but instead the process between the two. The paranoiac being someone who basically uh, dives headfirst into representations and uh, knowledge and the demand that knowledge gives. Paranoiac loves representations because they are simple, they are knowledge, and they are truth. I'm putting that in quotes. They are what you might, what Deleuze might call good sense. Uh, They are the ability for us to have a knowable world. That is what a paranoiac wants. Schizo's the opposition. Schizo has no desire or large-scale representations, and is instead far more concerned with wherever they're at and connecting with the things directly around them, the, the nature of sort of uh, the, the connective syntheses operating as they operate. And that pendulum between the two is, I think, yes, very much. They continually are referencing that, and here they start really diving into it, where it's the pendulum on one side and then the other moving back and forth across the both. I think that really does work. Yeah, I mean, maybe to that first point, I'm not sure the, I'm not sure about the a bit about the paranoia, but I think the thing they're making is the ontological point about how through the paralogisms, um, the three socii, the body without organs, and the paranoia and schizophrenic um, processes, 
are basically constructed as opposed to in schizoanalysis, right? And if you walk that back into what we just read, they're now, they're making this distinction right here about how the, the double impasse functions in that manner. Um, just to mention, the reason I say that is because uh, around the, prior to this time, by 20 years, uh, Lacan had come up with the concept of paranoiac knowledge. Uh, and knowledge exists kind of in a handful of different ways, but paranoiac knowledge, to be very specific, um, is uh, has to do with the alienation of the ego and the desire to be able to sort of know everything. It's a structure of paranoia, desiring absolute knowledge and mastery. Uh, paranoia, and Ken can correct me on this, but my understanding is that's basically the idea of paranoiac across all psychoanalysis is that it's a demand of absolute knowledge and mastery. That's an interesting question. What, how does uh, the, the use of paranoia change in psychoanalysis and that? I, I like that. Oh, you're looking at, I'm thinking of, um, it's very early in the book where they lay it out. Uh, 1.2. See here, by the organs, seating, productive, unconsumable, Newman. Schraber's divine. There's a bit here where they actually quote Freud and what they and paranoia, but it's something like it's the it's the way things get dissolved. I think it is. Here we go. Uh, we are of the. In order to resist, okay, this is page nine. In order to resist link, connected and interrupted flows, it the body without organs sets up a counterflow of amorphous, undifferentiated fluid in order to resist using words composed of articulated phonetic units. It utters only gasps and cries that are sheer, unarticulated blocks of sound. We are of the opinion that what is ordinarily referred to as, quote, primary repression, end quote, means precisely that. It is not a so-called counter cathesis, but rather the repulsion of the or rather this repulsion of desiring machines by the body without organs. This is the real meaning of a paranoiac machine. The desiring machines attempt to break into the body without organs, and the body without organs repels them, since it experiences them as an overall persecution apparatus. Uh, I thought there was a bit about Freud they quote. Though. No, 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 but that's, I think, again, that follows with what I'm saying, that the nature of the paranoiac machine is that they are attached to representations, they're attached to signs, they're attached to things that are, and that is that is what we can call, or theoretically in, in idea, mastery or pure knowledge. The idea that there is a God truth, and that that is their desire, the paranoiac machine's desire for the body without organs. It perceives them as a persecuting uh, apparatus, and this creates the sort of uh, neuroses and other things. So it's, I, I think it still follows. Um, uh, again, the paranoiac is obsessed with representation, and definitions, and differentiation as they go into quite a bit. They'll get into that in three as well. I want to keep moving because we are a little over two hours. Um, I do want to keep moving because we're two paragraphs from ending. Uh, the true difference in nature is not between the symbolic and the imaginary, but between the real machinic element, which constitutes desiring production, and the structural whole of the imaginary and the symbolic which merely forms a myth in its variance. The difference is not between the two uses of Oedipus, but between the anedipal use of the inclusive, non-restrictive disjunctions and the Oedipal use of exclusive disjunctions. Whether this last use borrows from the paths of the imaginary or the values of the symbolic. It would also be necessary to heed Lacan's word of caution concerning the Freudian myth of Oedipus, which, quote, has no way of holding its own indefinitely in the forms of society where the tragic sense is increasingly lost. A myth cannot sustain itself when it supports no ritual, and psychoanalysis is not the Oedipal ritual. End quote. Even if we go back from the images to the structure, from imaginary figures to symbolic functions, from the father to the law, from the mother to the great other, in truth, the question merely retreats. And if we try to envisage the time put into this retreat, Lacan goes on to say, the sole foundation for the society of brothers, for fraternity, is segregation. What does he mean here? I would think he means an exclusive use of the disjunction. 
Can you elaborate a little bit on that? I, I, I get what you're saying, but just um, exclusive use of the injunction as opposed to? As opposed to the inclusive use uh, being kind of the oppositional to that. The exclusive use of the disjunction is naturally segregative. It's either or. You are either daddy or mommy. That's it. Uh, the inclusive use is allowing things to be and go down the paths that they happen to go on. The, the nature of uh, segregation inside of uh, Elecon is not an easy one. <laughs> it's, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying already. trying to find the specific paper and uh, lecture Lacan gave. Um, give me a second. I got a crit right here. Let me see what I got. It's also, I don't know if, if other non-native speakers can, can relate to it, but it's just sometimes words like disjunction are fully abstract to me. And so I need other words to remember what they mean again. Yeah, because disjunction, we have this, like a uh, distribution. Right, for, for our purposes, we're talking about how distribution takes place. So while Brooks is looking for his quote, and that this will probably lead him into his quote, if you go back to that topic sentence, the true difference in nature is not between the symbolic and the imaginary, but between the real machinic element, which constitutes desire and production, and the structural whole of the imaginary and symbolic, which merely forms a myth and experience. So the play they're making here on the con, I mean, this is kind of cool because what they're saying is, right, is really not about the split between the symbolic and the imaginary. It's about the machinic element that constitutes desiring production and the way the second syllogism is used here, which is going to be uh, tied up in the conditions for society. Oh, I remember this now. This was one of my favorite uh, stories that I found uh, with segregation. It's... Uh... Anyone who was part around for the first one will remember this. This is the story of the young man who describes his father, family with pride during an initial consultation, shares a disturbing memory in a session. At age 11, he heard his father saying that while he was in a taxi at a traffic light, he saw a group of transvestites on the street. His father says, taxi driver had to tell me, but you know they are men, right? It was shocking. They really looked like women, his father said, and he added, those guys should all be killed. The patient felt that this incident had affected the respect and good memories he had of his father. Uh, coming back to this young man, during a session in which he was mentioning his father, saying those guys shall be killed, the analyst asked him to describe the complete sentence. Uh, the analyst said, so the taxi driver had to explain to your father that those people in the street were not women. The patient answered, oh, exactly. And then he started laughing. He thought they were girls. He liked them. Discovering his father's brutal statement was an effect of an encounter with his own opaque and strange jouissance, and that it was his own horror that drove the irrational reaction of hate to the other brought the patient relief. Uh, there are many references in Lacan, mainly during the 70s, where segregation is linked to power struggle, to history, to capitalist pseudo-discourse, and to science. In Seminar 18, Lacan claims, quote, it should be said that there is no need for ideology, for racism to be constituted. All that is needed is a surplus jouissance that is recognized as such. We can see from this quote that beyond any identification, beyond any imaginary tension, any logic of mass culture or historical factors, Lacan refers to jouissance as that which is at the heart of the matter of segregation. We clearly understand that what is usually denied is the jouissance of the other, but this is not the interesting part. It is here we can retroactively think in the scope of another of his ecrites, one from his early teaching. Uh, going back 20 years, during his research on paranoia, Lacan states, when he attempts to show that it is precisely the cacon of his own being, the madman tries to get at in the object he strikes. We find the seed of segregation here, since it is one's own jouissance that remains misrecognized. It is when something of this jouissance returns from the other, the most fundamental denial sets a drive in motion to attack it. So that's the, uh, when they say here, if we try to envisage the time put into this retreat, Lacan goes on to say the sole foundation for the Society of Brothers for Fraternity is segregation. Uh, he means it very much in this sense, the misrecogni misrecognition that it's not a matter of 
the overall ideology for racism or separation. That's not what does it. That uh, for him, it's the way that desire has a surplus jouissance, uh, which I don't know how Quadri and them would uh, sort of respond to that. But I think they would agree with the idea that the structure of things, it doesn't matter what the myth is, Oedipus, racism, whatever ideology, there is a sort of uh, soul foundation of the Society of Brothers for fraternity having segregation. That's my reading of this. It's just about, sorry, a little longer. It's one of my favorite uh, little passages on it. No, I really like the connections you're making there, though, because even with fraternalism, right, uh, there's people in the fraternity and there's people who aren't in the fraternity. But in a larger sense, there's a, there's a way in which there is an integration of the whole there. So that is to say, like, just because you're not in the fraternity doesn't mean you're not recognized under the disjunctive syllogism. So even though it's exclusive, there's a way in which you're still, there's an integration there, yeah. So if we if we take what you just read then and we, we look at this question of segregation, what does he mean here? And we go back to that sentence just before that to, to add context there and to really drive a point home. Even if we go back from the image to images to the structure, from imaginary figures to symbolic functions, from the father to the law, from the mother to the great other, in truth, the question merely re retreats. And then we get the question, is segregation? What does Lacan mean here, right? This question of how the disjunctive syllogism, when we go into the splits of the, the, the mother and the other, <laughs> to make a rhyme, the father and the law and that, we're not getting at the way the disjunctive syllogism functions, at it, whether it's paralogistic or syllogistic, right? The questions of retreating in that sense. I like that. And it's, it's um, again, going back to the same thing where it's uh, the one crux they keep coming back to. Uh, do they need Oedipus? No, it's not Oedipus. It's not psychoanalysis. It's not fascism. Like, people aren't tricked. This is about how the apparatus of all of these things work and how they produce. That it's not Oedipus necessarily doing it. It's the apparatus. Uh, the the structure. All right, uh, the last paragraph, and then we'll have a discussion and open it up or just close it down. I have no idea. In any case, it was appropriate. In, a, uh, in any case, it was inopportune to tighten the nuts and bolts where Lacan had just loosened them, or to edipalize the schizo where, on the contrary, he had just schizophrenized even neurosis, injecting a schizophrenic flow capable of subverting the field of psychoanalysis. The object, small o, erupts at the heart of the structural equilibrium in the manner of an infernal machine, the desiring machine. Then a second generation of disciples of Lacan supervenes, less and less sensitive to the false problems of Oedipus. But if the first disciples were tempted to reclose the Oedipus yoke, didn't they do so to the extent that Lacan seemed to maintain a kind of projection of the signifying chains onto a despotic signifier, lacking unto itself and reintroducing lack into the series of desire on which it imposed an exclusive use. Was it possible to denounce Oedipus as myth and nevertheless maintain that the castration complex itself was not a myth, but in fact something real? Wasn't this tantamount to taking up the cry of Aristotle? We really must come to a halt in the face of his Freudian Ananke, this rock. Look, well, Lacan would genuinely be angry about being compared to Aristotle, so that's fun. Yeah, and to down to that, though, what if the comparison is not simply with Aristotle? So we saw how Freud has this really um, conceptually lucid um, phase at the beginning, right, where he's creating a lot of conceptualities. He's doing some very interesting things uh, in terms of the unconscious. And all over time, he kind of, the Oedipalization overtakes a lot of what he did um, built up, right? Excuse me. So we have a way of seeing how paralogisms affected even Freud's conceptual work and how it kind of takes it, uh, how it kind of can regenerates it, actually. Uh, if we take that then and we think about how does psychoanalysis develop out of Freud and the way Freudianism or Freudian followers or what have you build off of that, right, and may even make it uh, more prominent in a sense, right, regenerating it. The thing I'm seeing them doing to Lacan here is saying, yeah, Lacan, you've done a lot of 
you're, you're doing some really interesting, lucid, conceptual work. You're creating some lines of escape even, right? But then there's this other thing where you look at what your followers are doing now or your second generation. There's a way in which your work hasn't made the, the full break uh, or rather introduce the line of escape uh, more prominently, yeah? So in this sense, you get Lacan, since he's really big on being like the proper interpreter of Freud, you get him in a, a critical point where he's actually placed as a sort of like Freud in that sense, where he risks uh, kind of the repetition of what, what goes on with Freud in that, in a different context altogether, but similar nonetheless. I like that. And again, the line that they, uh, I think, use and will use again is that uh, Lacan uh, took the pylons that Oedipus was built on and blew them up with dynamite only to have the pylons above fall directly into the holes they were in below. It's a, he tried to break Oedipus by utilizing Oedipus and uh, that's their uh, critique there. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Michael. Uh, the citation is from Aristotle's Physics, mainly saying at some point you'd have to stop the links of causes. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Thank you. You, you missed the hat, Santel. He's, uh, he's saying the citation. <laughs> Sorry, Michael, I couldn't resist. <laughs> Excellent. Did we get the citation for that uh, Lacanian reading that you did earlier, Brooke? Yeah, I tossed it into the chat. I will. Uh, I will add the book to it. Uh, it should be in the uh, we have a resources uh, thing. Head into there. It should be waiting for you. Thanks. Can I um, bring back a question that I've maybe already asked four times, but always it still stays with me and that is not it. It has been mentioned in this chapter, but it's more of a general thing. Please. And and that is um, Again, on uh, when something uh, is categorized as a global object and when something is categorized as a as a partial object, um, I still have sometimes have a difficult time um, grasping that. Also, because I feel like depending on your point of view, you could call a lot of things global objects or you could call a lot of things partial objects. Um, and yeah, I was just again wondering how how that process goes. Like, when is something a partial object? Because, just to give an example, like if you, if you would call your mouth a partial object, well, you could also still yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, no. Uh, so a partial object, uh, and this is where it's fun. Technically, we can't talk about them. So not in the not in the way of utilizing words. A partial object is not a thing. Uh, I have a microphone here. A microphone is not a partial object. If I were to say excellent, inside of it, there's a condenser. Condenser's not a partial object. Sort of is. Uh, a, a global object, a global person, a representation. If I were to say excellent, I grabbed the microphone, there's a meaning behind that, a larger scale meaning. It's not as brutal as, say, man, woman, daddy, mommy, but it still exists as that. Partial objects are the literal thing that's connecting. So let's uh, go back. The easiest way to describe this is a uh, child who's two years old, a uh, two, two days old uh, feeding. Does that child go excellent? There's mommy. Here comes nipple. Yum, yum food. No, it sees thing connects lips, connect blah, blah lips, connect nipple, uh, tongue, milk hits tongue, milk goes down throat. These are these are the partial objects that are connecting, not the things. We don't talk about the mouth. Like a mouth can be a partial object, but mouth is not a partial object. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, this is actually the first time that I that I that I saw it this way. So as you're describing it, a partial object is not an object in the traditional sense. It is a function. No? It's, 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 it's easier to think about these things as machines. Yes, instead of representations. Representations are gross static apparatuses. If we think about machines, for example, the baby feeding machine, all the parts that are part of that, there is no larger thing. It's the machine that's doing stuff. If we add a representation to it, for example, uh, I, I am a dad machine. Like I kind of am. I 
carry him on my shoulders. I teach him how to cook. We, you know, we, we play games, we wrestle. He begs me to tickle him. Like I do the dad stuff. Now, all of that is more representational than anything. The machine is when I'm, my fingers hit his tummy and he's giggling and laughing and he's, he's tickling. That's a fingers tummy machine. That's the tickling machine. Those are the partial objects. Now, dad telling his son or dad, a father tickling son is a representation. There's a larger thing happening there that has, you know, stuff underneath it. This is how I've been differentiating it in my head. If that's wrong, I know we have people in here who probably can correct me, but that's generally my, how I've been explaining it. Yeah. I mean, you're on your way. Um, partial objects are the perspective of what's going to become a desiring machine, right? So with the partial object, you don't have yet the, the question of the binary law of whether it, uh, the partial, whether desire, desiring production is animating it. So as to introduce the question of, will it be differentiating a flow or I'm sorry, will it be emitting a flow or receiving a flow? Yeah. And that's the process. Those are the two capacities of machinic differentiation right there. Yeah. So at that level with partial objects, we're, we're asking the question of how it basically is going to be um, in relation into desiring production. So as to make the partial object into a desiring machine. If we take this then in terms of the first synthesis, we're talking about how partial objects uh, fit with uh, these flows of desiring production so as to become desiring machines, right? If you notice at this point, and I think this is um, one of the things Brooks is getting at, we're not privileging an object over another here because we're talking about how they connect as opposed to how a partial object would uh, sort of be transcendent and thereby determine how they connect, right? And this is how you get the first paralogism is when an object is elevated above the, uh, the assemblage in that manner during the first synthesis. So like the phallus where it's detached, yeah, and becomes a whole object in term, instead of a partial object. Now the phallus becomes transcendent and the other desiring uh, and the the partial objects in relation to desiring production, there's a sense in which that paralogism it spets the unconscious to work in relation to the uh, the transcendent phallus, and that becomes a contingency for what's going to become the transcendent uh, signifier. If you want to jump into the second synthesis, so the whole idea here is then that actually the partial objects are not to like. He you wouldn't ever have the goal of, of, of describing them as having characteristics other than how they function within de, uh, desiring production. Yes. And, and the idea is if we start at the bottom, let's think of the bottom as desiring machines and partial objects connecting, which they're kind of, it's kind of one and the same thing. Uh, if we start at the bottom there, just as they connect the natural experience of life leads us let's assume that there's nothing else. The natural experience of life leads us to learn and connect certain things to each other. For example, the infant drinking from mommy's breast. That's a thing that learns over time. Uh, my son yells feed on occasion still. Uh, the, these are the way it goes. Now, if it comes the other direction, where instead of saying feed, I go, you need to be a man. And suddenly it's not desiring machines and partial objects connecting and pure experience of me learning as I learn, as I go through life, but instead being told here is what a thing is. Here's how to be. That's the other direction. And that's where the representation comes in and says, excellent. If you want to be a thing, you need to be a man. You need to technically be a father or a mother. You can also be you, but if you're not going to be one of those three things, well, then I don't know what you are. And that's kind of fucked up because then it's like, wait, so I'm going to be nothing. And that's, that's scary. It's like, Oh shit. I want to be something. I want can I be dad? I'll be dad. I'll be dad. I can, I can be dad. Uh, and then suddenly we start charging that in that direction. It's a, because I said so yeah, master signifier, uh, bullshit happening here. So partial objects are essentially, if you can, you can get to partial objects when you no longer are dealing with representation. That's the layer. Like if you can peel away representation in general, that's where partial objects are. But so when you're talking about, uh, for example, linguistics or or um, semiotics or uh, those 
uh, ways of thinking that 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 are about words and definitions and that kind of stuff. They you, you would never th- they do not intersect necessarily with because I feel like in my head previously I would have maybe I put partial objects in that realm as well, but I I feel like how you're describing it now they're not really in the same realm. Um, so when you're is that is that is that right? So when you want to describe actual things, we're not talking about about partial objects at all. I. I... Go ahead, Jack. Um, you got to focus on the relationships, yeah. So with um, with signifying and chains and that, right, that does relate to partial objects, but that's not simply a question of like um, the English language or that, yeah. That's a question of um, like the capacities or rather the functions that the, uh, the desire machine will perform, yeah. And then with the other bit, those point signs in the body of the organs correspond to the desiring machines. So there's a relationship you want to focus on to help you, uh, to help you contextualize them. And so how do you describe something as a thing, um, without it becoming a global object? And, and, and can I try to answer, is, is the answer found in that assemblage idée? Sorry, idea. I was I was slipping my touch in there. Um, I I would say it it becomes how you utilize representation because there's no way to get around representation. We have to use it. If you're using it in a prescriptive way that is coming from, we'll say, let's say there's two directions. This is just not the right way. But let's talk about the molar and the molecular. If you're using it from a position of the molecular to describe things that are happening around you, oh, I'm thirsty. I could use this. Um tired, I have to go take a shit, uh, I'd like to go watch a movie, I don't know, just stuff. If I'm dealing with my own stuff and I'm dealing with it at that level, the moment it becomes prescriptive and you start, uh, and all of us have had this conversation, also we've done this, where we're utilizing language that we didn't necessarily build or understand ourselves or we don't have motivations within our own desiring machines to say, but instead we're saying things out of obligation or discussing things out of obligation. Uh, or through that representation from the molar down. It's a directionality thing in the process is how I see the difference. So if we're talking and we're just here talking through things, we all have our own bullshit we have to work through. That's the way it goes. But if I start going, excellent, this is not going to work because I have to tell you, uh, this doesn't sound very American. Uh, That's not a thing you can even fucking engage. Like it's not even possible for you to engage that response because of all the problems with that. Uh, Suddenly that changes it. Now, if I'm having this discussion, you're like, well, it doesn't sound good to me because of X, Y, and Z. We can discuss stuff, but we are dealing with representations. It's a direction of how we use it and what it's utilized for, descriptive or proscriptive. I hope so. This is where it starts getting fun because the, like the, this, the schizoanalysis stuff, uh, we're going to be doing, if anyone here wants to join, we're going to be doing our first schizoanalysis. Uh, we're going to be spending two weeks working on Avatar, James Cameron's Avatar. Uh, because the light analysis done by Mark uh, with K-Punk and all that stuff, Mark Fisher, uh, we don't necessarily think was enough, and it's a hell of a film. Uh, I have a history with it, and I have to be very upfront with all of that uh, on a professional level, but that's the way it goes, and I know you guys are just fucking with me by choosing it, and that's the way it works. It just pisses me off. Thank you.